Hello, Internet, and welcome to episode 11 of Brain Drizzle. I am your host, Q Dragon. With me, as always, is Jack. Hi, Jack. Hello, how's it going? Today, we have a, a special guest, James Gurney, or Jim the Evo, on YouTube. Hello, Jim. Hello, how are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing good. So, uh, why don't you start by telling our audience a little bit about your channel? Uh, okay, uh, so my channel is Kina App. Well, basically, I am an evolutionary biologist. Uh, I also work in microbiology, so I make videos looking at the history of and evolution of different diseases. That's what I mainly do on the channel at the moment. I also do a bit of skeptical work and some biotechnology work as well. Well, that sounds cool. So what initially inspired you to sort of get into making videos and, and then sort of to pick that topic? It was actually mainly to, to get into an argument, probably. I first came across uh, creationists on the internet, and obviously YouTube, is, uh, there's, a, there's a large amount of them there. So I made myself a, a YouTube channel to argue with people. Um, <laughs> from that, I just started making movies, uh, oh, it's four, maybe four or five years ago now. I, I made my first YouTube video, I think it was 2008. That was looking at what I was doing at work at the time. I was making uh, biofuel from algae. And then, yeah, from there I went on to make rebuttals to uh, Shock of God when he took over Venomfamat X's channel. That's sort of what got me into it, but yeah. This is kind of creepy, because that's pretty much exactly my story, except, <laughs> except way less awesome, because I didn't do any of that biofuel stuff. <laughs> No, nah, he he just he just sent some miracle water to Kent Hoven in prison. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. I actually I remember seeing your your stuff when it first came out with the um, when you called uh, what was it? Casey Yeah, Please. that was fantastic. Thank you. Oh hey, so we're we're in the same club it seems. Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> good club. Yeah, definitely. So that, then, what made you switch just the sort of ongoing series that you're doing now? So I, I wanted to get back into actually to making something that I actually knew about. I mean, I, I could carry on making videos about biotechnology, but they're just, I mean, they're interesting, but they're, they have a very sort of limited capacity, I think. And making a, a sort of a series looking at history and biology captures a lot of people's interest. It captures my interest as well. Something I'm very interested in is uh, my bookshelves are covered in sort of books about how certain plagues began, where they began, how they actually affected human history. Because we, we tend to think of history as being, you know, human driven, but really and truly, it's uh, a lot of it's decided by how different viruses and bacteria mess around with what we try and do. So society is a disease, man. That's, that's pretty gothic. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to give you props on that. <laughs> I, I'm wearing my eyeliner, but. Uh... I, that, that's my eyeliner. It's a, it's a kind of a morbid to topic, but it is it is pretty interesting. Yeah, uh, I, I try and not make it as morbid as I can, you know, and sort of I don't I don't try and be grotesque for the sake of grotesque. But it's I mean it, when you when you talk about diseases, obviously the natural and worst outcome for most diseases is death. So you can't really get away with it, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, I think if you made a video where it's like also. This disease killed no one. That'd, that'd be kind of boring, really. Yeah. <laughs> Toxoplasmosis doesn't always kill people. Sometimes it just yeah. lives quietly in your brain until you die of other causes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, there's, I mean, lots, lots of diseases actually um, get on quite well. And there's, there's things called opportunistic pathogens, and they only ever become a problem when when something else goes wrong. So the the bacteria actually work on mainly, mainly is uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And oh, I, I have that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. M most people, I mean, it lives in the environment. You can go out tomorrow and isolate it from, from the, the, the ground. And it, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't kill a lot of people. But if, if it causes a problem, it causes a very big problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it has kicked my ass several times. So I'm, mm -hmm. I know from experience. <laughs> I completely lost my train of thought. Hello. Um, <laughs> and this is why we edit the podcast. Yep. Oh, that's staying in, man. <laughs> yeah, God damn it. <laughs> this is the where I rule the world. This this is my domain. This is how history gets made. The person the person who writes the books and edits the podcast. You know? Exactly. <laughs> Welcome to my inner sanctum. It's, 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 that's going to be a weird future. Because in, in like the future, these are going to be the kind of history records we look at. Mm. Sort of Terrifying. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 
Dear God, they are just as inept as us, is what the future will say. <laughs> oh, so you mentioned that you were sort of or an evolutionary biologist. Are you like still going to school, or like where are you? In your... I'm in my uh, third year of my PhD. So in in the UK, it's a slightly different. Because I'm assuming most people are going to listen to American. In the UK, it's quite a bit shorter to do a PhD. It's only three and a half years is the the minimum. Mm -hmm. Where in America you can do six. I mean, that it's it's very unusual for someone in the UK not to finish their PhD within four years, because oh. that that's how long you have money for. So you, you tend to finish it. Um, so I've got yeah. another year and five months to submit my thesis. And is your focus uh, some sort of ev evolution of a disease, or it's evolution in a very nar narrow sense? So I'm looking at a thing called you know about kin selection. Uh, oh yeah, yep. Yeah, so uh, I work on the theory of kin selection with bacteria. Wait, some of our audience members might not know what that is. I should explain kin selection. Yeah, yeah. please do. Uh, so kin selection is the idea that certain genes and certain behaviors can be passed on, even though they might not be beneficial to the individual. For example, altruism. It doesn't make sense in a classical Darwinian sense to, to be altruistic. If, if you hurt yourself at the cost of something else... So if I if I die for my brother, how does that evolve? And we see this in nature. We see this in bees and certain insects and even some mammals. Bees. <laughs> but uh, it can be explained by kin selection. And the idea is that obviously if you if you help a relative, the genes that are causing you to help that relative are shared among you. So you can you can explain altruism and traits like that by explaining the fact that actually it's not the individual that matters, it's the, the genes and how those genes are represented in the population, how they spread. So I work with that on bacteria and we use bacteria to test some of these ideas because you can't, you can't test a lot of them in large animals like birds. You can't go to a bird and chop out its voice box without affecting its other behavior. You can't say, well, we, we, we've silenced this crow, let's see how it reacts naturally. You can with bacteria, you can just cut out a gene and say, we've just, we've just taken out this one gene and it definitely does this and we know, we know it doesn't affect anything else that we're interested in, so let's see how it interacts with its relatives and non-relatives. Now, this kin selection uh, research that you're doing, is it at all related to quorum sensing, or is this a, is this a different mechanism? No, no it, yeah, it's related to quorum sensing. We use uh, quorum sensing as the uh, communication system. So we're looking at how these communication systems uh, have evolved, and how they, how they, because they, they, feed, they feed into the kin selection theory, because obviously if you respond to a signal, you produce something, the production of that good might benefit other people. For example, in Pseudomonas, they produce a, an enzyme that breaks down lung tissue, and bacteria that don't produce it can still use the, the products from that enzyme. They can gain a, a benefit without putting in any cost. Mm -hmm. And th that's all controlled by quorum sensing. By the way, for those who don't know, quorum sensing is a communication mechanism for that bacteria use. They basically just produce a certain chemical, and then when a population has produced enough of a certain chemical, collectively, that triggers some sort of uh, reaction in the bacteria. So they will build up a population, sense that there is a bunch of them, and then they might become virulent or whatever. Yeah, that's, that's a very good explanation. Thank you. <laughs> it's what we do yeah. at Brainstorm. <laughs> So what got you sort of just into science in general? Because I think a lot of people are interested in sort of how people get into this kind of work. Or yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, again, probably to get into an argument, um, I, was, I was going to originally do religious theology. I'm an atheist, and there was a, there was a point that I realized that there's only so many ways I can say, I think you're wrong, before I start repeating myself. So it wasn't really going to be a fulfilling career for me. I did that at a uh, high school, so we call it college in the UK. And at the same time, I've always enjoyed biology. And I started reading about evolution at this stage. And actually, I, I knew about it, and I, I kind of got what it was about. But, you know, you don't really ever get taught it. You don't get taught the, the fantastic, brilliant details and all the cool, juicy stuff that happens in evolution and how it actually works and the, the, the blinding simplicity of it sometimes. So I got into that because one of my theology teachers had a big hatred for Richard Dawkins and I you know I wanted to do sort of like see the what the issue was and get a, like a balanced a balanced argument so I went and read uh, The Blind Watchmaker and after I read that I thought, this is fantastic this is great I should you know think more about this 
And from there, I went on to do uh, genetics at university for my undergrad. And the reason I went for genetics, not zoology, was because I thought, again, you know, there's not much of a career in zoology, uh, genetics and microbial biology. There's biotechnology and all these other medical benefits as well. And when I saw the PhD that I've got now came up and it was evolutionary microbiology, I thought, well, that's, that's fantastic. That covers both the things I'd love to do. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Jack, I think James and us are going to get along just fine. <laughs> like, this is freaky how, like, similar our sort of YouTube backgrounds are. Yeah, you two should, like, totally hang out. Are we brothers? Is that possible? Maybe, maybe. maybe. This, is, like, this is eerie, because it's, like, exactly how I started making videos and how I started yeah. getting into science and... Now I'm in university too, but I'm just starting, so oh well. I've now now I feel left out, man. I all I did was make a music video yeah. and hang out in blog TV chats. <laughs> <laughs> so with your going back to your channel, what are some other future plans, or is it just sort of more diseases? Well, actually, I was um, I'm trying to decide where where to take it next. I mean, I'm going to carry on doing. Uh, history infection. I've also I've spoken to uh, the Society for Microbiology, the sort of the UK premier microbiology group, about making some educational videos for them. That has to sort of go through the, all the the ringer and sort of decide whether or not to do it, and it might end up on their channel, it might end up on my channel. Not too sure. But I mean, I'm also sort of thinking about doing looking at some skeptical stuff. Like I taught myself. Uh, as most people do when they do it, I taught myself some magic when I was younger, and uh, I taught myself how to do cold reading. And so, cool. so yeah, so I, I, I want to uh, like sort of, I don't want to say expose mediums and stuff like that, but maybe do a few things looking at how, how these things work and, you know, some of, maybe even some of the psychology behind it. Because that's what I find the most, most interesting about magic is how, how the psychology works and how the trick actually fools people. Because normally it's very, very simple. It's misdirection and a bit of fancy stuff for your hands, but... The psychology of what causes people to see what you want them to see is fantastic. And also the psychology of how charlatans do what they do. I mean, like cold reading when, when mediums do it. When you see them on TV, there's always a disclaimer that says, uh, this is purely for entertainment purposes. And that might be true. The people who are doing it might think it's just for entertainment. But those are real, real uh, grieving relatives. And, you know, they've, they've lost children, they've lost loved ones. And that's entertainment to people. Yeah, it is exactly, and oh, I, I got to complain. My mom loves a show called Long Island Medium, and she's like, but it's a reality show. I'm like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't really know of any channel that really delves into that sort of psychology and also magic, because, I mean, the thing I love about, like, magicians like Penn & Teller, they, like, admit, like, we are tricking you, but yeah, it's yeah. still an amazing uh, show. Yeah, yeah, oh, they're fantastic. <laughs> actually, I actually got to see the, their show uh, live in Vegas once. It was incredible. <laughs> Neat. <laughs> yeah, I hear, I hear it's pretty good. I, I have, I've never seen it though. I've only ever watched them on the TV. Yeah. So, are you ever worried about running out of diseases, or is that sort of a never-ending um, bucket? Uh, now you say it, actually, just no. Uh, <laughs> Party favors. There's a lot of diseases I can go through, and I mean. Almost every single one of them has at some point had some human contact or, you know, caused something to change in humanity. And there has to have been someone who had to discover them. And the, the process of discovering a new kind of bacteria or, or virus is, is normally quite interesting. It's, you know, there, there was, there's definitely a personal connection there. And obviously as well, I haven't, I haven't even touched the surface on some of the bacteria and viruses I've already covered, like tuberculosis and the plague. I had to, I mean, the plague I did a two-part series on, but still, it's 4,000 years of human written history, and then all the stuff before as well. So there's, you know, there's, there's a lot to go over still. Now, I was, I was wondering, how would you pick what the next video is? It's obviously not a historical chronological order. You no. would pick a disease and then yeah. go from there. So most times um, when, I, when I'm writing up the story, I'll remember other facts that sort of either play into what I'm writing about at that moment and how they're related to other bacteria. Um, I sat down a little while ago and actually sort of sketched out what, what, what the bacteria and viruses I'd like to cover in the future episodes were. And I've kept mostly to that, to that schedule now. Um, the next one's going to be on prion or prion diseases. And then after that, probably measles. 
there's no actual sort of method. It's just, oh yeah, that, that happened and this happened. And then I, I'll, I'll think, I'll write that down and go, oh, next time we need to talk about this. And, so, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, prions are basically just sort of misfolded proteins that can cause the misfolding of other proteins, which yeah, is yeah. Uh, the kind uh, similar, well, pri- uh, one kind of prion that probably most people have heard of is... Uh, mad, mad cow! cow. Yes, mad cow. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought you were talking about interrupting cow. <laughs> Oh, there, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, a flesh-eating virus. How does yeah. how does that work? I can't think of any flesh-eating viruses. I've heard of them before. I've heard like the term flesh-eating viruses out in Timbuktu or whatever, out in the boonies yeah. or out in Africa. Like I've heard the term before. Is that actually a thing, or is that like just a turn of phrase, like rocket surgeon? <laughs> a rocket surgeon. That's uh, that's interesting. Um, I, yeah, I can't. I can't off the top of my head think of any flesh-eating uh, viruses. But I mean, you if you look at think about Ebola, which is a virus, the the damage it causes could by some people be called flesh-eating. And I I wouldn't be surprised if there is if there is a virus out there that does cause the skin and virus to sort of break down and, and look like it's being eaten away by by the pathogen. There's definitely I mean, there's flesh eating bacteria. There's, there's a bunch of those. Yeah, uh, they're they're always fun for a Sunday. Things to look on Google Images, I suppose. I, I can't. Yeah, I can't think of any any viruses that would do that. Yeah, it's um, probably just people getting confused with yeah. flesh eating bacteria. That that's one thing that I never understand. Is like it's to me. It's a. I mean, obviously, I, I come from the the academic side and with my ivory tower, but. To not know the difference between what a virus is and what a bacteria is is always worries me slightly, especially when it comes to like antibiotics and stuff. And people, people try and take antibiotics for viruses, like, well, they won't work. Yeah. Oh God, I know, man. I remember a long, long time ago. In a galaxy far, far away. Practically, almost, you'd think. I went to something that was known as a wellness center. I I caught a cold. I knew that the infection I had was most likely a viral infection, and they tried to give me amoxicillin. And I tried to tell them that, no, this isn't going to work. And I actually had a lady screaming in my face. Very unprofessional. I I took it for two days and got sicker and finally had to say, sorry, no, I can't take any of it any more of this stuff like they just basically and that drove me nuts just the unbelievableness of that how what and this was a medical professional yeah. too who was just basically shoving me out the door with pills because she didn't want to deal with me and she assumed that a it wouldn't kill me mm. and b she assumed that i was ignorant enough to basically take it and walk off yeah but like that was actually her whole thing i guess she was so jaded with her low-paying job um the ignorance of the people there and you know basically just wanted me to get in and get out it was uh anyway um one idea that i have about this however one of the reasons why i think people will get that confused is honestly Lysol commercials and the mm-hmm. fact that both viruses and bacteria and fungi and just anything that can possibly make you sick or give you the sniffles is looped under the blanket description of germs. Yeah. They're just germs. Pollen's a germ. <laughs> Bacteria's germs. HIV, germs. <laughs> it's all just germs. Here come germs. A particularly small hamster, germs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I I, I think mm-hmm. that has to be it. Lysol commercial kills all the germs. Um, antibiotics, they kill the germs. There's a there's a great uh, XKCD comic where he's looking at one of those antimicrobial things and it says it kills 99.9% of all bacteria. And like there's he, he does the math, there's like 10 billion or something bacteria per square, per square centimeter. And obviously 99.9% of 10 billion still means there's several million bacteria <laughs> left there because there's just, there's just so many. Yeah, I remember uh, that. And yeah. again, the comic just ends with him going, ew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think there, there is a lot of over-prescription of antibiotics. Mm. I've heard it's partially for the placebo effect of like, hey, take some pills. And I guess yeah. they don't. They they don't want to give you random shit. Because I'm sure if you like said sugar pill, you would look into it. And be like, wait a minute. But I know sometimes there are antibiotics that have like other like just anti-inflammatory effects. Like me, me right now, I'm on a low dose of a particular antibiotic. So there there is some in certain cases legitimacy just to prescribing antibiotics when it's not necessarily a bacteria. Oh yeah, definitely. 
Well, actually, my thing is bacterial, but since it's not active right now, they're actually just giving me an antibiotic that isn't effective against Pseudomonas, and they're just giving it to me in low doses for the general anti-inflammatory benefits. They should give you some medical marijuana for that. (laughs) I'm good. (laughs) You don't fly. (laughs) You're not. I, I have to drive a wheelchair everywhere. I don't need to be high. (laughs) (laughs) that that sounds like a bumper sticker to me (laughs) yeah that's um operative uh term there is need what do you Hmm. want although i did i am the one that passed an obstacle course at school wearing drunk goggles nice so if need be i can drive while drunk (laughs) a wheelchair (laughs) not a car obviously yeah yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Excellent. Seems like we have a lot, a lot in common, James. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Any it's... thoughts about like sort of medical or, or disease-related news? So I mean, there's been a lot lately in, a, uh, in the English media about antibiotics. Again, I think one of one of the lead scientists in the government came forward and said, you know, this is actually this is going to be a problem. We're, we're coming to a point now where we're going to lose a lot of effective antibiotics and uh, as someone who works not not the front line of antibiotic resistant stuff it is it is quite scary to think that you know we've we've had these 80 odd years of relatively effective treatment against almost every single bacterial pathogen and and that could possibly come to an end and then and then there's gonna be there's gonna be quite a lot of troubles but you know we um I say we, not me. Um, people are working on on alternative therapies, and the, the the work I'm doing does does look at how actually to mitigate different kinds of infections. So a lot of people are looking now at not so much single bacterial interactions, but how multiple species actually co-inhabit. Because there's no there's no part of an infection that's just normally caused by a single pathogen and as a bacterial infection. You do get single infections from some, some things but they, they always end up they always end up living in a sort of community of different bacteria and we're trying to work out how how to alter this community in favor of the host you know there's there's all these things about competition and game theory that exists and how we can manipulate the system especially with like quorum sensing you know they're, they're using communication to make themselves virulent can we essentially negotiate with them as you would with well, I guess you wouldn't with the terrorists, but we we kind of trying to negotiate with these bacteria to to sort of calm them down a bit. The other big thing, and obviously the news recently, was phage therapy. So this is using bacterial phages to treat infections. I don't know how much you guys know about phage therapy. Oh yeah, and actually we covered a few weeks ago. We covered a, a phage therapy mm. story on Brainstorm. So yeah, and uh, I was just bringing it up because if you ever need sort of help quickly summarizing something for. You know, incorporating recent events into a uh, history episode or doing yeah. a new series, you know, they should definitely consider collaborating. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. Yeah, a basic brainstorm is basically um, we've built a social machine which does exactly that. Oh, and by cool. a social machine, you mean me. <laughs> uh, well, uh, other, people, other people get the stories, and then I just process them through my brain and poop out a story. Okay, our three invisible butlers are the lock, stock, and barrel. Mm. You are the bullet, and... No, you are the gunpowder, and I am the bullet. Okay. Anyway, I don't know where that metaphor was going, but let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Murka! Gun metaphor is away. <laughs> but yeah, no, us former skeptic, current skeptic, trying to get into mainstream science mm. people need to stick together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, it's uh, it's good to have communities, isn't it? So. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, uh, again, a r- reminder, if you're watching on iTunes, go to youtube.com slash jimtheevo, and if you're watching on YouTube, uh, there'll be a link in the video description. Um, well, that went pretty well, but I, mean, uh, I don't really think we have much else to talk about unless you had something to bring up. Um, no, not really, yeah. I'm... Regale us with stories. <laughs> Gather okay. around. Or oh, right, we no, can I'm end this before... Favorite disease, go. Yeah. Oh, favorite disease. That's a good one. Oh, I'm going to have to think about this now. You've sprung that on me. Ooh. 
Well, I mean, one of one of the things. So, the, the, I'll I'll break it down to my favourite virus and favourite bacteria. Uh, my favourite virus is HIV, and as weird as it sounds to say that's your favourite, but it's um, the reason I like it so much is the anti uh, anti retroviral drugs that uh, they used to treat it are fantastic. Just just the interactions, how they work with the virus, and how they work inside your cells. It's just it. It's just so cool to think that we live in a world where people have worked out exactly how something that you can't even really see with the most powerful microscope in the world, how we've worked out it flips around its proteins to join onto your cell. And now we've gone and gone, you know, we can build a chemical that can come in there and mess that up completely. So, I mean, that, that, that's just awesome to me. That's, that's so cool. Um, and uh, favorite bacteria... Uh, ooh, I'm probably going to have to go with uh, Pseudomonas because I work with it, um, and it smells nice. It smells like grapes. Really? Yeah, yeah, it smells, it's, it smells fantastic on a plate. See, how do uh, my breath never smells like that, so <laughs> I, I'm getting gypped. Yeah, I'm Maybe maybe you just don't notice it. Maybe when you were going to school, you were like going along and they're just like, man, that kid always smells like grapes. <laughs> He's got great breath. <laughs> what toothpaste that would be it? amazing. Imagine if you could just spray something in your throat and they would give you a custom breath. Mm. I think they call that uh, they, they call that breath spray, dude. <laughs> That's a thing. I'm, I mean, a bacteria. <laughs> The fantastic invention of the world, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, bacteria that um, gives off like the sweet smell of patchouli. It's a gift that keeps on giving. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Nice. You should read Transmetropolitan because I could see that existing in that world. Don't worry, she's always trying to push that. Um, I, I have to ask. Yeah, Transmetropolitan, Neanderthals, and bees. Man, I, 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 I am a simple person. I like simple things, and I believe that you should like them, too. I will come to your door, knock on it, clutching my transmetropolitan to my chest with a vacant expression, and say, do you have a moment to talk about Spider-Jerusalem? <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so, uh, Neanderthals, that's one thing I wanted to look at on, on infection as well. See, you know, because uh, there's, um, there's a lot of differences between us and Neanderthals, but not, not that many, I suppose. You know, they, they, were, they, they weren't human but they were a equivalent species. Um, and I want to try and get to see some of some of the infections they had as well and saying, you know, look at look at these infections. So these people suffered exactly the same way we did as well. They had the exact same infections. I think I think that's a way of I don't want to say humanizing them, but uh it, it certainly brings a level of empathy to them as well. I was going to say, I, think, I, I can't remember if it's Neanderthals, but I remember seeing uh, a lecture a few years ago about someone talking about that there was uh, either proto-humans, either I mean, Homo erectus or one, one of the early ancestors, clearly had some sort of infection, but had also clearly had medical care from someone else. He, this individual wouldn't have survived without the care of uh, his community. So that clearly shows you know, that the, these people weren't mindless savages. They were, they were civilized in a sense, and they were, they were caring, just as caring as we are today. You know, that even though we, we, if we met one of these people on the street, we, we probably wouldn't know the difference. Although um, we'd probably go, like, holy fuck, Homo erectus! You know, <laughs> if you met him on the street. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then like, somebody would like, start giggling, and just like, hee hee, you said Homo, and you said erect. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, but I just pulled a moral, moral dilemma out of my ass. Would you, re if you had to choose, go back in time to study ancient diseases or study alien bacteria? Ooh. Well, I'd probably be safer studying alien bacteria. I actually, I might have the opportunity to go back. Not go. I'm not going to go back in time. I haven't got a TARDIS, um, but I, I've, I've got the opportunity to go and speak to people who study Viking archaeology and they want to talk to my group about um disease epi epidemiology and stuff and so how how these diseases spread through viking trade routes and stuff and how how the vikings dealt with diseases we have a we have a postdoc in my group who is uh, she calls herself a freelance viking so she's uh, she's put us in touch with this archaeological group who are apparently one of the the uk or maybe the world's leading viking people so we're going to go and talk to them at some stage about different viking diseases 
Um, so I've got that opportunity. So I'm gonna have to say I've got to study alien life. That's always fun. Oh man, see, I came up with like a stupid hypothetical, and then you just blew me out of the water. I mean, like, by the way, I know a goddamn Viking, and we're gonna study Viking yeah. disease. <laughs> we're gonna go around <laughs> Viking measles. That's yeah. awesome. Oh yeah, well, well, us and our um, it's us and our. Oh. Damn it. <laughs> We can't talk that. I've got Damn it. <laughs> Damn it. Q, we need to meet more people, all right? More Vikings, evidently. I, I know, my, my sister's kind of a gangster. I mean, well, she she's not in a gang, but, I mean, is that really a prerequisite <laughs> anymore? It's it's 2013. All these things started when I got myself uh, an Indiana Jones-style hat, so I'd, I'd suggest going for one of those, and the, uh, the, the, the adventure just follows after there. You know. See, I was never much, much for hats. You know, they always just ride up on the back of my head. It's, it's, a, it's a nightmare. So, uh, obviously, that's my only problem, uh, is the hat. Get a whip. Get a whip. Again, I can't really use a whip. Eh. Uh, uh, I think, uh, revolt. <laughs> uh, get a pirate, get a pirate flag and put it on the back of your chair. I can do that. Oh, 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 man, what's that French word for when you think of something too late? I know a pirate. <laughs> Jack, I, I don't think people who download movies count. No, no, no. This one has a boat. And Again, lives in someone, Florida. someone who downloads movies on a boat doesn't count either. No, 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 no. He doesn't get. He he doesn't download movies on the boat. He downloads movies at his dad's house, and then he gets on Facebook. This is the lamest pirate ever. <laughs> hey. I, I... Again, I, I, I might have actually once been a pirate by mistake. Um, well, not by mistake, just from childhood, childhood shenanigans, I suppose is the word. What? Oh my god, you, import, you smuggled goods out of childhood shenanigans? Okay, now that's something you and I have in common. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I grew up in, uh, in uh, Mauritius for a short while, the, uh, the tiny island in the Indian Ocean. Stop making up places. And obviously... <laughs> just, that's just clearly made up. But yeah, they had these animals called dodos. Man, <laughs> those are extinct. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they were. Yeah. And uh, yeah, my brother and I used to uh, go and because we lived next, you can't really live in Russia without living next to the sea. So we, you know, there's always there's always boats around. So we used to go and just take boats and sort of move them across the bay, essentially. So I, I, it's not it's not exactly high piracy, but it's it's definitely in the same category, I think. There was no, there was no like wenches or anything like that, which is a shame. But uh, was... there, there really is a, a shortage of wenches nowadays. Yeah, they, you just don't, don't have the numbers anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. No wenches. No, I think I think I count. Hey, screw you guys. No wenches. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I didn't say anything. That's uh, that's one of my favourite uh, pirate misconceptions: is the idea that pirate boats were um, and sea boats were sea boats, all kind of boats at sea, I suppose. Um, that there were there were no women on board, and there were, women were bad luck. Pirate boats were jam packed full of women, women pirates and prostitutes, and just people, well, that's you know, people hanging around. That's what it was basically a boat full of syphilis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a pleasing mental image, isn't it? Yeah. Speaking of infection, syphilis. Tell tell us about why isn't that your favorite? It's my favorite. Oh, wh why is it? Why, well, why is it your favorite? I mean, it's it it's well, it's legendary, and people. I mean, it, syphilis is the scapegoat <laughs> for all for tyranny, dude. Okay, people say that Hitler had syphilis, and that's why he went insane. Um, let's see, Tiberius, the uh, Caesar that was, I think that was Tiberius, uh, the the one that was before Caligula. Also, the middle name of Captain Kirk. Go on. Yeah, I mean that guy. Yeah, maybe that's where I get it. Anyway, the dude who was before um, Caius, aka Caligula, which means little boots. That guy went crazy because of syphilis. They say that Caligula went crazy because of syphilis. Uh, so many kings went crazy because of syphilis. Uh, they sometimes some say that ki the King George, who invaded, who um, basically invaded his own country because um, we were because we were breaking out, man. We we were mad as hell and we weren't going to take it anymore. We the people, blah blah blah. You know the American Revolution. They say he had syphilis, although he probably actually had porphyria. Every act of tyranny gets blamed on syphilis. Well, he had syphilis and it rotted his brain. 
So I James, probably... I think it's obvious what your next episode needs to be about. Syphilis. I've, already, I've, already, I've, I've done one on syphilis actually. Oh, you I, did? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, which one was it? It was, it was a f- either the fifth or sixth one, I think. Oh. But it sort of like um, syphilis uh, probably came across from the New World when uh, people discovered it. So like Caligula probably couldn't have had syphilis. I mean, I, I go into this a bit in the episode. I don't I talk about Caligula, but the 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 general accepted theory, which um myself being a rebel don't don't so much subscribe to is that syphilis was brought over from the new world as as a payload back from people having taking uh indian women as as sexual objects and stuff like that so it 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 appears to have popped up in the middle of the uh 17th century i think it is um but the problem with that is there's several remains from pompeii showing with people who are showing syphilitic like diseases they have because it gets in it at tertiary stages and secondary stages it can get into your bones and cause massive deformities within the actual skeleton imagine being the first guy to d- discover syphilis that would suck <laughs> that would suck <laughs> i think the first guy who discovered syphilis didn't it was the first guy who had syphilis he probably, well, yeah. had a, he, must, he probably had a good time beforehand, though. Yeah, or, or do you mean the first person to discover exactly what it is? No, I just mean, like, you're just a dude, and then, like, you're the first guy to get an STD, like, the first of that kind. It's like, well, shit. <laughs> oh, man, you know what would suck? If he got it because somebody, because a pimp spit in his eye, and not because he got to have sex. <laughs> that is one up worse than a bit of a your letdown, scenario. Isn't it? You know, if he if he didn't even get to do the crime, but he had to do the time, because somebody spit in his eye. One of my favorite things about syphilis is uh, again that sounds odd to say, uh, <laughs> is um, the the different names it's had throughout the, the ages. They've always they've always been, and again they've said strange things to say. They've always been slightly racist. I just find it quite amusing because like the the English called it the French disease, the, the Turks called it the Christian disease, the Spanish called it the Dutch disease. So whoever whoever was the the enemy of the state at that stage, they they named it after, and it's just sort of like. All through history, this all no one, no one wants to. And nobody can forget the the um, the type of animosity that the Spanish and the Dutch had for each other. <laughs> what? Yeah, well, it's all it's all trading like on the seas and stuff, isn't it? So the 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 uh, yeah, there's just everywhere. Like there's a, there's a tiny group of islands, the the Thacian Islands, that they call it the English disease. And when I first thought, I was like, well, they're like two thousand miles. Like east of New Zealand somewhere, you know, they're they're in the middle of nowhere. Why why are they, why are they calling this the English disease? And obviously, it's because English sailors went there and introduced the disease to the island. So from there onwards, it was uh, it became the yeah the English disease. I think it was also the reason why Cook died because he his crew introduced it onto an island where he got killed. And uh, when he came back a few years later, they they were they were quite pissed at him. Oddly enough. Oh dear, oh dear. When you said Cook. I heard Kirk. Kirk, yeah, no, yeah, that's what, that's what happened to him originally. That's why the series ended. I yeah. wouldn't be surprised actually. The amount of uh, alien booty he tried to get. Um, Try exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, well, no, you, you only ever see the success. You never see him fail. Well, that's not good television, is it? And you never hear from the civ- the civilizations that he succeeded with yeah. because you know syphilis. <laughs> Straight away, just dead. Yeah. I, 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 I can just see that that awkward conversation with McCoy. <laughs> I'm sure he was used to it by now. Probably. <laughs> Damn it, Jim! If you keep doing this, it's gonna fall off. <laughs> I'm tired of a- analyzing an entirely new biochemistry every goddamn time you you get some. <laughs> Damn it, I've cured syphilis six times. Yeah. He keeps spreading it, he keeps mutating and coming <laughs> back around at us. And of course, there's going to be all the alien diseases as well that you get as well. So, like, just. He, he wouldn't have lived long. Although, what do alien diseases work? Well, uh, so there, there's, a, there's the whole um, War of the Worlds idea, isn't it, with uh, human diseases killing. Killing off the invading... Were they Martians? Yeah, they were Martians, but I guess it yeah, could be argued Martians. that if Earth was seeded through transpermia, mm. or vice versa, <coughs> from Mars, then the uh, Martian or uh, Martians and Earth organisms would have a similar biochemistry. But yeah. for aliens that are outside the solar system, it's less likely. 
It's, I mean, uh, it, uh, so <laughs> we're strolling into the realm of science fiction, which is fantastic. Oh, we we um, always do that. <laughs> it's, it, I mean, the the specificity of say a virus or bacteria for its host is quite high. So you 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 know you'd 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 probably struggle to be infected by an alien disease. Even even you know it, it, the, the panspermia would have to require you know maybe two billion years separate if if they go from near the beginning of complex life and you, you humans have become immune to certain diseases or, or more resistant shall we say in the short time we spread throughout the globe so this is why this is why syphilis was so deadly and why smallpox was so deadly to people who hadn't been exposed to it because they'd had enough time to evolve a susceptibility to it yeah and both and both um get spread uh with blankets either being handed to you or you're under them with uh yeah <laughs> with captain kirk or one of the caesars yeah so what well, i think, well, I think what you're saying is <laughs> alien sex always a good idea always fun always fun always worth it highly if recommend you it some, I, I, I just imagine like your face with like a thumbs up alien sex ding <laughs> <laughs> recommended <laughs> Just underneath little thing, I'm a microbiologist, it's fine, go ahead. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> now, um, sex with Neanderthals, would that have spread STDs? Yes, definitely. If uh, if they had some, I, I mean, they would, if, yeah, well, if, they had, if they had some sex and they had some STDs, uh, I, would, I would bet good money that they would spread between the two populations. Mm, kind of you you sound so kind of disappointed, Jack. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, just like if they did it, you know, if if they were around each other. Here's the thing: like a lot of people, they're just kind of like, no, there's no way that uh, modern humans went up there with the Neanderthals, and then everybody's like, yeah, maybe. No, they didn't find any. Yeah, they did. No, they didn't. Well, Europe is a big place, yeah. so that's yeah. kind of that's like the basis of the controversy. We haven't looked everywhere yet, and it would only take like a group of maybe twelve people minimum to be able to go up there and make a stable human population that would exist. Maybe the hum maybe humans went up there, died out, interbred, and then went back up later. Mm. You know, there could have been several small groups that went up, man. I I'm I'm holding on. There's, I'm holding on. Well, there was definitely a, there's definitely a dysphoria throughout the you know, throughout the world of uh, how humans spread, you know, in, in waves out of out of the fertile crescent and from Africa. So it's is you know it's not, yeah. not out of the realms of possibility. I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't wouldn't keep your <laughs> keep your fingers crossed they're going to fight turn up tomorrow. But uh, oh, she is. It's yeah, no. too late. <laughs> my my fingers are perpetually crossed. I I'm, I'm holding out, hoping that I am part of Neanderthal. I, and as a member of the Neanderthal population, I am offended by your by your previous <laughs> comments. However, I do bring them up for a specific reason. Um, their um, their nasal passageways are were different than ours because they had to cool the air to keep from sweating because that would have been deadly for them. Um, but and if you like some of the most um, some of the most deadly some deadly common infections are ones to the upper respiratory and lower respiratory system. Yeah. Do you think that that morphological difference would be significant enough that even though something is just as equally contagious, just as equally catching between humans and Neanderthals, it would actually be completely deadly to one while harmless to the other? Go. Oh. See, I would, I, off the top of my head, I'd say no, because I'd imagine that they would have some inbuilt system for dealing because obviously it's it's a big problem you've got a big open space so they would probably have mm -hmm. methods for what well, their body would have and their immune system would have methods for dealing with infections they got in that way so they probably be susceptible to their own things but less more resistant to our things if that makes sense because they their their immune response would have to be better equipped for dealing with things getting in that way that that would be my yeah. That's completely baseless. I'll be honest. I'm I'm I'm. I'm, oh, I'm oh, don't I'm, worry. Everything yes, is baseless on this podcast. So <laughs> you're, you're you're okay. I'm in good company. Um, yeah, yeah. You 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 just got stumped by um. You just got stumped by the punk rock lackey. Congratulations. <laughs> Buy a t-shirt. <laughs> we, we did just talk about like alien sex, so you know it's it's all relevant. <laughs> Yeah, completely. But yeah, so 
I don't know. That's just kind of something that, that be, I wondered. Cause... Yeah, it's, it, I, I might be very wrong, and it, it might it might have been actually part of the reason. Because obviously, if, when you start living in higher populations, uh, diseases can spread easier. So if if mm -hmm. large human populations rose up around uh, Neanderthals, then it, yeah, it could, that could have been the end of them. They could have just you know a, a simple respiratory infection could have spread through them like wildfire, and that would be the end. Uh, my... Yeah, but also, um, also thinking the other way, if they, if they, if their immune systems were better mm. equipped to fight off the respiratory infections, like you um, hypothesized, yeah. then something that would just give them the sniffles could wipe us yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, possibly, possibly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's you know without 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 uh, seeing and actually looking to see what the ecology is like in, in Neanderthal's nose. It's uh, <laughs> be difficult to 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 guess because it's uh, uh, going back to what I said earlier. You know, we, we we're looking at how these bacterial populations exist, how multiple species come together, and it is incredibly complex. Just the the interactions that can happen. They communicate with each other. They produce all these different chemicals. They produce all these different plasmas and different phages happen and they this thing wants this resource this thing wants this resource this thing produces a chemical at this temperature which kills off that one which releases a toxin which kills us it's a mess to be honest but it's uh so it's difficult to to guess these sort of things without without having experimental evidence uh, mm. my, my my favorite thing going away from infection is with the anathols is the possibility that they had grave goods um which I find really interesting, the idea that they were, in some sense, religious. And uh, that, that if, if uh, certain people accepted the Neanderthals were either human or weren't human, that must cause issues for religious people. <laughs> like the idea that there's a, a second set of religious individuals out there. Yeah, that would, that would mess things up, potentially. Honestly, though... Um... Something you have to keep in mind with a lot of religious practices, now especially funeral practices, I'm going to give you a few examples. Burning the body, placing the body up high, like how the, um, not the Baha'i, the, uh, um... Zoranostrians? Uh, thank you. Yeah, the, the Zoranostrians did, thank you. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the word that I was looking for, and it just like went <laughs> away. Yeah, the uh, Zarathustra's peoples, um, like they do, or burying them like many like is common here in America and in a lot of the uh you know or putting them in a you know putting them in an airtight box even and like you know sealing them up the idea is okay rotting bodies are pretty dirty and if you have a whole lot of rotting flesh around you know you're going to get infections these were ways to deal with same reason why um cats cats in the desert bury their feces it's to keep you know, it's to keep um, it's to keep infection at bay. That is, yeah, it's a hygiene thing. That is the primary reason for these, um, you know, for these practices to do with the dead. Everything else is basically social, religious, and sentimental accoutrement to that. I mean, it has a dual purpose: the social and the um, sanitary. Yeah, definitely, so definitely. yeah, I mean, keep it's... it in. So I mean, a wood isn't necessarily a religious thing. It could just be they chose no, to no, designate yeah, yeah. a specific spot where don't you know don't try to plant there. That's where we that's where we put the dead bodies. Yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, there's also a bit, with that as well. There's the idea of forethought that the idea you should you should um, there's a reason behind doing this practice. Even even if no one you know it's one of these really cool things. That even if no one knows what the reason is, it's it's become learned through association of. Like mm -hmm. you know, not not getting ill and not not having these rotten flesh sitting around. No one no one really knows what the purpose was, but they did it anyway because it was it was helpful. Yeah, well, it's even, it's even the kind of common sense. Like, should we mm. keep the rotting thing around? <laughs> hmm. Kind of attached to it, but not really. Yeah, yeah, it's just like, well, you know that you know, obviously, hey, that rotting thing is my kid, and I don't want to accept mm. that. My kid's dead, so I'm gonna keep clutching the baby. Yeah, but it's growing <sighs> fur, so you know. Yeah, but so that you know, they have to take it away, and they have to give the mother a reason. You know, well, um, this, you know, God being wants this to happen, or you mm. know, in order for your kid's soul to be safe, you know, yeah. we need to do the, we need to take steps A, B, and C. Really, religion as also, a whole it smells. is. 
Yeah. Religion. Yeah, that too. Religion as a whole um, is really just a, a social system used to keep track of all like the different uh, methods of living. And well, there's yeah. a lot of there, there's fallacious stuff mixed in with the useful stuff. I, I mean, that's why most of like the the old Old Testament is purity laws, like you know what not to eat, how not to dress, what not to do. I mean, a lot of, mm-hmm. a lot of religious people say you know that these things made sense. Some of them didn't, like wearing mis- mixed fabrics. Actually, to... um, actually, if uh, you wore mixed fabrics and some kind of mold got on there, then you couldn't save the garment. And oh, not only... okay. Yeah, yeah, like seriously, because I mean, there's a whole sec, there's a whole section in there talking about what to do when different types of mold got on stuff. It gets mm-hmm. if like green, the green mold gets on the leather, burn it. When to burn it? When to put it in the light? When to keep it in the darkness? And if it's mixed fabric, you're just kind of like, well, it's kind of hard to identify what kind of mold it is. And some of these molds could spread to the other fabrics very easily. Like let's say there's something that you could take care of on wool, but if it got on the leather, mm-hmm. you're met, you're screwed. And mm-hmm. these are people wandering around in the desert. Yeah, I was it, gonna say it's, it's not these you, things. You can't just go down and buy a new shirt, can you? So. Yeah, exactly. Although yeah. we're not eating bacon, that's just madness. So that one is, as far as I know, is to do with it's a sort of a it's obviously it's a cultural thing, but it's there was uh, the early proto Jewish tribes were uh, invaded by the Philistines, um, who came from the sea, and they when they settled the land, they used to breed pigs. And uh, it was their way of saying, you know, we're not going to trade with them. We're not going to buy pork products. We we don't want any pork. Though. There's also the idea about having, you know, um, parasitic worms inside the pork as well. But yeah, that, that, that's, if, that's if, a problem, but not a huge one. I mean, uh, 90, some ridiculous percentage of the world's population has a parasitic infection right now. So it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's... it's... Yep. Well, those particular parasitic worms that um, are often in pork, if it does not get cured or does not get um, mm-hmm. cooked all the way, if you even if you get the infection today, it's very hard to cure, and it is a slow, oh. painful death. Yeah. So there is that, and it, it was in pigs and... I believe in like goats or sheep, like basically anything with cloven hooves. The idea yeah, that yeah. the devil has cloven hooves actually came from the pigs. And not yeah. only that, but pigs take a, while they actually produce the most meat per, they, they actually produce the mo- most meat for what they take in and they can eat almost anything. Yeah. They, left alone, they can devastate ecosystems and they also take a lot of more water than raising other things. So they are resource heavy for, if uh, you, you can't, t- taking a herd of pigs with you, if you are nomadic or if you have to move a lot, they just they take a lot to raise. They're worth it if you yeah. have what you have. But however, the Jewish people were often were often nomadic and often yeah. were often marginalized, were often minorities. So these were just it just wasn't worth it to keep them. There's several different yeah. reasons. No, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's no it's no single uh, reason for them not to not to keep pigs. Because so, yeah, because bacon is delicious. So they, yeah. there have to be, there have to be several good reasons not to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, especially saying it's also the most, like probably the most like meat efficient animal, mm-hmm. that too. Oh, it's very meaty and delicious. Oh, well, more more bacon for us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> well, I think we should wrap up wrap up here before we completely go off the rails. Um, I've I've just remembered. Yeah, it'd drive me insane because I have to edit all of this. <laughs> <laughs> just to annoy you a bit further, I've just I've just remembered a great bit of uh, news biology news about infections there there's been an outbreak of measles in wales in the uk uh, because of the low vaccination rates yep that sounds about right <laughs> yeah well here's the larger issue that um because we have the exact same madness here in the u.s mm. the larger issue is not only ignorance but it is name and it's namely willful ignorance the wolf and ignorance that is being um, perpetuated by the general mistrust that the people have for um, yeah. the government and for authority and for the established institutions. The, a mistrust that has in many ways been earned. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the, the health policy and pharmaceutical interest, industries aren't fantastic at doing public relations so much, are they? Oh, um, I have an idea. 
we get just yeah. a really grungy, hippie-looking guy, and we just get, like, a bunch of those people, and then we just set them up to secretly make vaccines, and then we'll just tell people it's a herb or something. Yeah, all natural herbs, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, then they'll say, oh, the government spooks are... Oh, the yeah. government spooks and the shadow government are sending um, out people to forcibly vaccine our kids because yeah. they're on to us. Yeah, that, that's how it'll get twisted around, man. Yeah, I mean, bad idea you, won't you, work. Yeah, you can't, the government can't keep a secret. So uh, all these people, you know, the conspiracy uh. theorists and stuff, it's like, how, you know, you have no idea how inept the government actually is and how inept people are at keeping secrets. Some, yeah. you know, it, it come Here's... out and it's it just doesn't work. They're, they're talking exactly. about... Exactly. Having... Here's the... Th uh, forced vaccinations here's the in the UK. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, here's the thing. Yeah, the government is inept at keeping secrets. That's why people feel that they know the truth. Yeah. It's just like, well, I read it in yeah. a book, and this dude found out because the government's inept at keeping secrets, but they have the power so they can continue doing these things even though we know about it. There, are, And not only that, but the government has actually... Yeah, governments have actually done some pretty messed up stuff that they tried to keep secret that came out later yeah. on. The, I can think of a few things the U.S. government has tried to pull off that were just absolutely disgusting, mm -hmm. especially during wartime. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that your government probably has a few skeletons in its closet as well. The British government is is the king of skeletons in its closet. There was a, was a documentary recently about uh, how how British fell in love with tea. And it, it goes on about the opium war, the opium wars, and it's just it's so sort of British to go. Oh, you don't want to give us tea? Well, we're going to flood your ports of opium. How do you like that? And it's <laughs> like, well, that's that's <laughs> it's the, the English phrase. That's not cricket. Oh, that's, thank God, man! Opium, awesome, yeah. thanks. Oh, that backfired. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, uh, in in retaliation, one of the one of the things the Chinese government tried to do was try and stop the, the uh, import of rhubarb to the UK because rhubarb was a uh, a laxative, and uh, they 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 thought English people would essentially explode if they didn't get any rhubarb. <laughs> so we... well, I just imagine some Chinese people being like, "Okay, I have a great idea." Rhubarb. They love custard and rhubarb. No more rhubarb. Um, but that, that, that led to a thing. There's a thing in the UK called the rhubarb triangle, which is an area. It's like the Bermuda Triangle, but without sinking ships. We just grow rhubarb in it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's like I'm the Bermuda Triangle, but completely triangle different. Worst triangle ever. <laughs> <laughs> Depends how much you like God. rhubarb, I guess, or how how backed up you are. <laughs> uh, rhubarb. Can can you get it in jelly form? Because I could like if I start making peanut butter and rhubarb jelly mm. sandwiches for people. Uh, Tee hee hee. And better than X lax chocolate. Yeah. Rhubarb jelly sandwiches, that sounds fantastic. Or 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 mixing fleet into somebody's Well, butter. I mean you can you can have rhubarb strawberry pie, so I'm assuming you can make some sort of rhubarb strawberry jam. Yeah, I'm sure you can. You can jam everything, can't you? Yeah. Yeah, it's a jam some jalapenos, jam some rhubarb, had, jam some mandarin to, oranges, yeah. jam some radio. <laughs> mm, delicious transistor flavor. <laughs> Um, Lone Star. I've had uh, I've had chili jam before. It's fantastic. Uh, yeah, a jalapeno jam is awesome. I actually have some of that. Mm. Hmm. Okay, now yeah, we're talking about jam. So I think show. we should. Wrap We've gone, up. You know, gone from measles to jam. It's uh... it's a lot easier than you think. Going from measles yeah. to jam. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> well, uh, James, thank you for being on the podcast. Uh, right. I hope to hear from you again in the future, maybe collaboration, maybe just having you on the show again. But again, thank you. Check the description for his uh, YouTube and uh, Twitter and um, anything else you want us to link up? Uh, no, that's grand, yeah. Well, and just, just to say thanks very much for having me. Awesome. Yeah, seriously, check out this huge channel. He is he is legitly British. He has books in the background and everything. It's just a green screen. It's fine. No, no, they're, they're really there. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's that, that's got a little cool little like Triceratops skeleton, ah, yeah, and then you 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 got the whole British look going, and you're sitting there talking in a chair, and it's just kind of like, hmm, I'm British. That means I was born with a sense of <laughs> with a sense of composition. So I'm right on the third line, and they got the books behind me, and he del he delivers, man, he delivers. Oh, I have to put in some tweed in a pipe and just sit there. Hello. Yes. 
Well, yes. It's a, it's a infection. Uh, and then you just need two monocles. Just wear two monocles. Mm. <laughs> it's just like a sip of opium just starts chewing on some raw rhubarb. <laughs> 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 Well, I've got, I've got Talk next, about next syphilis. Plan, then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we'll uh. cut there.